Okay, um, on behalf of the Mount Island Wishes Honors Program, I wanted to welcome you all to the 2016 Spring Honors Lecture. One of the most important fact functions of the MAC Honors Program is it brings together students from across the academic disciplines, and it brings together students from across the country and even from the world, different areas of the world. Our goal is to create a diverse community of scholars eager to enrich each other's understanding of the world and in doing so, assist one another in discovering their place, their purpose, their voice in the world. Anybody that's had my classes know one of my favorite people is Walt Whitman. And you know, it seems to me that our goal in the Honors Program is very similar to Walt Whitman's vision of an all-inclusive American democracy. An America in which diversity is welcome and every person is of equal importance. For Whitman, America had to be the place where each person has the opportunity to contribute their voice. We're fortunate today to have a distinguished individual who's going to speak on immigrant voices. But before I turn over the podium and I won't get back, uh, I wanted to share a couple lines of Whitman on what he had said about immigration. From unnamed lands, afar they stand, yet near to me they stand. Some with oval countenances, learned and calm, some naked, some savage, some like huge collections of insects, some intense herdsmen, patriarchs, tribes, horsemen. Oh, I know that those men and women are not for nothing, any more than we are not for nothing. I know they belong to the scheme of the world, every bit as much as we belong to the scheme of the world, and all those henceforth will belong to it. The purpose of our spring lecture is to move us to a deeper level of thinking on the issue of immigrant voices. And I think we do, really will be successful, as you'll see with our speaker today, who Dr. Foley will now formally introduce. Thank you. But first, let me thank Glenn uh, for the Whitman. Um, talk about voices in, in American history. Um, he certainly is one. I really just have two assignments here today. One is to thank um, all of the people who have um, helped us bring this notion of voice almost uh, literally alive. Uh, I see Jane and Elena here, and they started us off uh, in orientation. Uh, they had students reading and discussing uh, uh, pieces on immigrant voices, uh, and they put themselves into community service efforts where they had a chance to develop and begin explaining their own voice. Our connections instructors, many of them are here today. Um, they focused a lot of their discussion on a seminal article about the 21st century, and all of our first year students have been exploring the theme as they read the book of unknown Americans. They've committed, and some of these students are in here, have created some captivating posters and Michael Jones and our librarians know that I'm up there once a week because I like to see how you all have decided uh, that voice um, is an issue in your lives. At Convocation, um, I talked about three voices, uh, Mairead, Mandela, and Malala, from Northern Ireland, from South Africa, and Pakistan, whose life stories many of you know, and you may know they're not all that disconnected from some of your own personal stories. At Convocation, we heard two fabulous stories about women's voices. One was the mother of our Convocation speaker, Dr. Porterfield. I don't know if you remember, but Dr. Porterfield's mother got her first degree in her late 20s. She got a master's in her 30s. She got a PhD in her 40s while raising two children herself. And she wrote her first book in her 50s. And her book was about American nuns and the role they played in helping to settle the West. Western frontier. The other voice we heard that day was a 90-year-old mother-in-law to one of our trustees who also wrote a book. And her book was about escaping Latvia in the 1940s. And her book literally gave voice to thousands who never made it out of that country. She got a standing ovation from many of you that day in the audience. So that's where we began our focus this year uh, on voice. And I want to thank all of you in here who have uh, taken hold of this theme and tried to develop it in your classrooms, in your classes, 
uh, and with your own voices. Today, we have the chance to hear uh, from another profound voice as part of our speaker series. When our speaker series committee sat down a year ago to noodle this topic, voice, uh, I think one of the things that we all agreed on is we needed to find somebody to speak to the notion of voice in terms of the immigrant uh, experience. Um, and we chose uh, someone to come here on a day when 43 million American immigrants and descendants of immigrants celebrate their heritage, St. Patrick's Day. We were especially interested in someone who might speak to immigration voices past and present, and we found just the right person. Cornelius Patrick McCarthy, he's not Italian. He wants it to be very clear he's Irish, and you can see the tie. Um, is here on St. Patrick's Day. He's Brooklyn-born, he's Jesuit-educated, he's the son of an old-fashioned shoe-leather newspaper man and a nurse. His mom was a nurse. Neil worked hard. He won himself scholarships to Dartmouth and Yale Law School. He went off to clerk for a judge on the second most powerful court in our land. He served as assistant United States attorney. And then he came back to practice law for more than 25 years in New York City to dabble on the edges and occasionally in the maelstrom of politics. And for a few decades now, he's made quite a name for himself as an essayist for the Huffington Post. Neil McCarthy is a father, a husband, a thinker, a fine writer, an excellent lawyer, and a first-rate friend. I'm delighted that Neil would donate his time to us again and we welcome him to the Southern Alleghenies and look forward to his remarks on voices of immigration, old and new. Thank you, Neil. Well, thank you, uh, Tom Foley, for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Mount Aloysius, for inviting me back. And uh, as Cornelius Patrick McCarthy, I'd be remiss if I did not say this. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, when I first spoke here more than five years ago, I came away impressed with the irresistible quality of the place. It's uh, striving students, it's committed faculty, and it's uh, created administration. But I also came away impressed uh, with the undeniable fact that Mount Aloysius is itself an immigrant story. It was founded, after all, by a group of Irish nuns, the Sisters of Mercy, in 1853, a mere two decades after the order itself was established in Ireland. And, like immigration itself, this institution became, and it remains, a work in progress. So I think it is fitting that on St. Patrick's Day, uh, this oasis of education founded by Irish nuns in the hills of western Pennsylvania uh, should be the setting for my thoughts on America's immigrant story. Again, uh, thanks for having me here. As a rule, the Irish are very fond of their opinions, but they are even fonder of those willing to listen to them. <laughs> I want to begin with five quotations five voices on immigration. And I want to invite you to guess when they were uttered, and if you are really ambitious, by whom. The first voice says this, and I'm quoting, why should the Palatine Boers be suffered to swarm into our settlements, and by herding together, establish their language and manners to the exclusion of ours. Why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens? Close quote. Here's the second voice. Again, I'm quoting. What kind of people are these citizens? Some are honest men seeking a home. Others will join the hordes in the coal region hive together in hobbits, live on refuse, save 90% of their earnings, and work for wages upon which no reasonable laborer could exist. 
close quote. Here's the third. Quote, they are brutal, base, cruel, cowards. Creatures that crawl and eat dirt and poison every community they infest. Close quote. Now the fourth. Quote, I'm surrounded. They are lovely people, but I just don't feel at home since the refugees came here in swarms. Close quote. Finally, the fifth. Quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending the best. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some I assume are good people. Close quote. Now, I'm sure everyone recognizes the author of the last statement. He is the Republican Party's presumptive nominee for president, especially given the results two days ago, Donald Trump. But what about the other four? Well, the fourth comment about the swarms of refugees and not feeling too comfortable was uttered by a San Diego resident in the 1980s. She was complaining about her Indo-Chinese neighbors, refugee immigrants and survivors from the Vietnam War. The third comment, the one about cruel base cowards, was made by a prominent 19th century New York City lawyer and diarist. A lawyer described just last week in the New York Times as, quote, a pillar of the city's Protestant elite. It was that lawyer's take on what he called, and again I'm quoting, lower class Irish, about whom he said, and finally I'm also quoting, England is right. The second voice that I just read to you a while back is from an editorial in the 1891 of Philadelphia Inquirer talking about the wave of Southern and Eastern European immigration, or immigrants rather, who came to this country in growing numbers after 1880. And the first statement I quoted, the reference to Palatine Boers, was made by none other than Benjamin Franklin. My point in beginning with these quotations, these voices, is this. While America has undoubtedly been a nation of immigrants over the course of its multi-century history, it has, unfortunately, also been a nation of immigrant haters. The immigration story in this country has, historians tell us, proceeded in distinct stages from the pre-colonial and revolutionary period, where all of us were immigrants or their pretty direct descendants, to the two great immigration waves, the first in the mid-19th century and the second between roughly 1890 and the 1920s, that together saw 33 million people come here in what was and remains, as one author noted, the greatest migration in world history, to the so-called exclusionary period from 1924 to 1965, where both numerical and, in effect, racial quotas were imposed that limited the pool of immigrants largely to those from Northern Europe, on up to the restricted but non-exclusionary period from then until now, which has occasioned an explosion of Asian and Hispanic immigration. In all of those stages, and across racial and ethnic groups, praise for immigration has regularly been drowned out by prejudice against, indeed in certain circles, hatred for immigrants. In the 1840s and in the 1850s, that hate manifests itself in the formation and the initial success of the Know Nothing Party, a political party which wanted to stop Catholics from voting increase the naturalization period from 5 to 21 years to stop immigrants from becoming citizens, and, when all else failed, actually kill Catholic voters on election day. In the late 19th and early 20th century, anti-immigration hatred found expression in the Chinese Exclusion Acts, 
which first limited and then ultimately ended Asian immigration until those laws were finally and fully rescinded in 1965. It also found expression in New York City election night attacks on Russian Jews in the 1890s, Jews who themselves were part of the ultimately two million refugees from pogroms in Tsarist Russia, in the anti-Asian harassment visited upon Korean immigrants to California in the early 1900s, in the lynchings of Italians in the 1890s, and the executions of Sacco and Vanzetti in 1927, and in the ubiquitous presence of job advertisements throughout the Northeast, punctuated with the warning that, quote, no Irish need apply. No immigrant group was spared. In our own day, hatred emerges in the form of overwrought demands for walls and calls in some circles to amend the Constitution to repeal the 14th Amendment's guarantee of birthright citizenship. This last effort is a response to the existence of undocumented aliens whose children were actually born here. These children are now referred to by some as quote unquote anchor babies, an invented class of innocents whose misfortune in life was to have parents who wanted them to live in a better place, and who, in what would decidedly be an American first, would now be forced to pay for the legal sins of their moms and dads. Perhaps most unfortunately, these prejudices, as the statements I quoted earlier show, have been shared by both the august and the average, by both the esteemed and the unwashed. In short, it did not begin with Donald Trump. It is, however, my fondest hope that it ended with him. And so my purpose today is to try to advance the beginnings of a strategy that might help us make this so, and to emphasize why such a strategy is particularly necessary today. In the case of certain subjects, and for those in my generation and your present generation, I suppose the <clears throat> inner workings of an iPhone uh, qualify as a good example. It is absolutely true that ignorance is bliss. That is not the case, however, when it comes to talk about immigration in America or America's Immigrant, immigrant voices. The most important thing we must do, therefore, with respect to this subject is to lay to rest some of what I would call America's most enduring immigration myths. And the first of these is that as a nation of immigrants, we are, quote unquote, a melting pot. We are no such thing. In fact, it is a very bad metaphor. It's a bad metaphor because it's not factually accurate, either as a matter of history or culture. It implies, at the end of the day, that we are all alike, when in fact we are all very different. In implying that we are alike, moreover, it demeans diversity and the benefits of diversity, and allows the world to reject calls for diversity as just another form of political correctness. So let's be clear. The immigrant populations who peopled these shores did not melt into some androgynous American whole. On the one hand, immigrants tended to stick together once they got here. They created ethnically centered support networks to survive prosper and aid family members left behind. In 19th century New York City, Boston, and Chicago, following the two great waves of immigration, there were distinct Irish, Italian, German, Polish, and Scandinavian neighborhoods. Each had their own churches, synagogues, meeting halls, bars, restaurants, and in some cases, even schools. They ate together, played together, prayed together, 
and lived together. All of these groups sent money home, either to lessen the poverty in Europe, from which they had fled, or to book passage for relatives who would join them in the New World. And English was not the only language spoken once they got here. Frankly, it wasn't even the only language spoken by the Irish after they arrived. I know that because as a young child, I sat beside my grandfather as he spoke to a cousin, and I could not remotely make my way through that cousin's road. Today, the same realities can be found in cities and towns throughout this country that are now home to Central American, Mexican, Caribbean, Chinese, South Asian, Indo-Chinese, Thai, and Korean immigrants. If a year only, a few back, my son worked in Mount Kisto, New York, a small town north of New York City, for a nonprofit group known as Neighbors Link. The organization exists to place immigrant day laborers in itinerant jobs throughout the town and the larger area. My son was hired because he had done all those jobs and speaks Spanish. He was therefore able to represent all of the immigrant day laborers looking for jobs, negotiate with the employers, and most importantly, ensure that the workers were paid once the jobs were done. In working there, and working in that small town, he discovered that the immigrants there were largely Guatemalan. In fact, they were largely from one town in Guatemala, and pretty much knew each other before they had even arrived. In each of these hoods, as it were, native cultures, Languages, worship services, foods, and habits are preserved, enhanced, lived, and ultimately shared. They aren't lost or discarded. Before 2000, it was difficult to get a Guatemalan meal in Mount Kisco, New York. Today, it's hard to get a bad one there. So, to put it simply, the myth of the melting pot distorts reality. We are not a melting pot and we never have been. But the myth, more importantly, distorts our goals. There is almost a universally held belief in the United States that assimilation is the sine qua non, the indispensable goal of immigration. It's asserted to be what those 33 million who came here between 1820 and 1920 accomplished, they assimilated. And it is what everyone who came here since is claimed to have done or told that he or she should do. But what really does it mean uh, to assimilate? And what are all those demanding assimilation actually looking for? Because this is where the myth of the melting pot does some of its greatest damage. On the one hand, assimilation can be taken to be the rough equivalent of learning the common language and the common laws. And these, frankly, are not onerous demands, uh, nor ones that immigrants resist. In fact, studies show that the overwhelming majority of immigrants want to and attempt to become proficient English speakers. And studies also show, and I want to emphasize this point, that as a group, immigrants are more law-abiding on average than their non-immigrant neighbors. But let's be honest. The call for assimilation is never just about language or the law. The word itself gives that away. The dictionary defines assimilation as conformity with the customs or attitudes of a group. To assimilate, also according to the dictionary, is to cause to resemble. And more often than not, conformity resemblance is what assimilationists demand. And the absence of it is what they very vehemently object to. So, worshiping at the altar of assimilation, learning English, morphs into the claim that there should be no bilingual education on the nutty assumption that being bilingual or trilingual is somehow un-American. In a nation whose motto, e pluribus unum, is in fact stated in a foreign language. <laughs> or again, worshiping at the altar of assimilation, swarms of Indo Chinese neighbors make a woman in California feel 
like she just isn't at home, even though they're all up in deep. Or a leading candidate for president can get away with the demonstrably false claim that Mexican immigrants are mostly rapists and drug dealers because they are not you. Or that same candidate can get away with the equally absurd notion that it is fine to build a wall on our southern border, thus keeping out the Browns, while at the same time categorically refusing to build one on our northern border, which would keep out the whites. That, unfortunately, is what the melting pot metaphor makes possible. In demanding that we march to the promised land of assimilation, and in asserting that this is the land to which all our forebears marched, resemblance, conformity with the group, becomes the defining mark of success. Our differences are denied. In fact, they are buried or melted away. The more different any would-be immigrant is, the less able he or she is to resemble or conform, the less likely he or she will be to assimilate, and the more justified any initial exclusion or denial becomes. In the end, we need to become white or mostly white Europeans here at home, just like Benjamin Franklin, even if we aren't. Now, I think we need a better way to think about this. And I think I may have found one, albeit by accident. In 1991, I met a man named David Dinkins. He was then the mayor of New York City, the first and today only African -Amer American mayor of New York City. And like all politicians, or at least most of them, Mayor Dinkins hired speechwriters for a while. I was a Dinkins speechwriter. In one of the speeches I wrote for the mayor, I mentioned the melting pot that was America. Now to me at that time, this seemed a mellifluous turn of phrase that no savvy politician would ever red ink or toss into the wastebasket, except that this is exactly what Mayor Dinkins did. David Dinkins didn't believe in the myth of the melting pot. America the nation of immigrants, wasn't a melting pot to him. It was a quilt, a mosaic. It was stitched together to be full and whole, but it was also resplendent in its multicolored, multi-textured pieces, each retaining its separate identity even as it became part of that whole. I think Mayor Dinkins was right. You can say many things about quilts, but you can't say that the pieces melt into each other because mosaics aren't uniform and they don't destroy differences. They highlight them and celebrate them and sometimes they even cry about them. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the true immigrant story here in America today. But don't take my word for it. Instead, I think what you should do is listen to some of today's immigrant voices. Because I think today's immigrant voices are the voices of that mosaic. The mosaic, I believe, is the story, for example, of Trong Nguyen. Here's what he said in 1986. Since I came to Chicago in 1976, I have been involved in building the Vietnamese community. Of the 12,000 Vietnamese who live in this city, more than half live in a 14-block area around the Argyle Street business strip between Broadway and Sheridan Roads. Uptown is called the Ellis Island of Chicago. Some 30 languages are spoken in the area. Mosaic is also the story and voice of Helene Cooper, whose mother and sister migrated with her from war-torn Liberia to Knoxville, Tennessee in April 1980. And today, he was a prominent columnist for the New York Times. Here's what Ms. Cooper said about her experience. Being in Knoxville felt like straddling two worlds. There was my physical world, 
where the monotony of going to school, with the monotony of going to school every day where no one talked to me. Then there was the world in my head, the one in Liberia before we left. That was the world I cared about, the world that I missed so much, the world filled with people I knew and people who knew me. It was filled with a deep to the bones knowledge that I was somebody and that I came from somewhere, a world that my ancestors had built from scratch through blood and sweat. And finally, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that the mosaic is also the story of the voice of Angela Gomez, an undocumented Mexican immigrant who became a live-in nanny and maid for a family in Fresno, California in the late 1880s. Here's Angela's letter to her friend, Mariana Chavez, in June of 1989. So you want to know what I eat, who I go around drooling over, who my friends are, well, hold on to yourself, girl, because here comes the whole boring role. One could say that here in Fresno, my life revolves around the radio station. That's where my best friends work, where I spend almost all my free time. We often go out to eat or sometimes to drink beer. I've turned into a regular beer drinker. It fascinates me above all on hot days, like, for example, 112 or 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine how hot that is if 100 degrees Fahrenheit is like 40 degrees Celsius. It's true, like your mom said when I was in Mexico, you sweat everywhere here. Since the radio station is a community organization and a not-for-profit, it receives help from various foundations and organizations, like, for example, the California Council of Arts. But there are others, like the church, that organize their peace bodies and send necessities to organizations. And then she says, all right, it isn't precisely the church, the Jesuits. The Jesuits, it turns out, were particularly important to Angela Gomez. In trying to get out of Fresno, she applied for work at a Jesuit volunteer corps in Massachusetts. And needing a letter of recommendation, asked for one from a Jesuit priest she knew in Los Angeles. That priest, however, decided that she should work with his organization in Los Angeles. Here's how Angela tells the rest of the story. Like three days later, this is her speaking to her friend, Ms. Chavez. Like three days later, Father Boyle called me and asked, why didn't I work for them? That they needed a person who would take charge of directing Casa Miguel Pro, a Catholic homeless shelter operated by the Dolores Mission Church in LA. He offered me a salary, a car, and then in parentheses she goes, I'm going nuts learning to drive a house, food, and medical insurance. And then she says this, and these are her words, not, not mine. Fucking right, I told him, yes. It's the best offer that I've had. It means that I'm going to be able to save. It doesn't matter to him that I don't have papers. On the contrary, they try to employ undocumented people. How does that sound, girl? Now, the question for all of us is, did Angela Gomez melt in or assimilate? Did she do that? Well, let's let her tell her story. Because in that same letter to her friend, Mariana, she says, you ask me how I feel. You know what? I've noticed a mountain of change in me. I feel more secure in myself. Like being here has helped me to know myself better, to know what I'm capable of. I've also learned to be more aggressive and not to waver in what I actually want. So did she assimilate? conform, resemble, melt? It doesn't sound like that to me. It sounds like she discovered herself. Now after laying to rest the myth of the melting pot and exposing the related flaws in the assimilationist project, I think there are two more equally damaging immigration myths that must be unearthed and discarded, particularly today. The first is what I call the southern border myth, and the second is what I call the illegality myth. The southern border myth is the myth that ignores the uh, origins of our southern boundary, the line that separates Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California from, Mex from Mexico, and then turns that border, or any border for that matter, into a definition of nationhood. And there are at least two things that should be said 
about that myth. The first is that there was nothing necessary about the United States' southern border. It is not natural, and nothing makes it essential to the definition of American nationhood. In fact, the border is entirely artificial. It was created by an act of war, the Mexican-American War of 1846, that many at the time, including a congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln, thought wholly illegal. At the time the war was declared, the United States and Mexico actually disputed the border between Texas and Mexico, which itself was a dispute left over from Texas's war for independence from Mexico 10 years earlier. The, Texan, the Texans thought that Texas stopped and Mexico began at the Rio Grande River. And the Mexicans thought their country ended about 150 kilometers to the north at the Nueces River. And this, the dispute was actually a lot sillier than even that because the Mexicans called the Nueces River the Rio Grande and thus actually thought that their Rio Grande was the boundary line they had agreed to when they settled with the Texans. In any case, in 1845, President Polk dispatched troops to the disputed area. The mission of those troops according to Ulysses S. Grant, a future president, but then a lieutenant in the army and at the scene, was to, and these are Grant's words, provoke the fight that would allow Pope to obtain a congressional declaration of war and seize Mexican territory. The army did so, and then President Pope did so. During the Mexican-American War, the United States seized all of the land of what then constituted the Mexican province of Santa Fe de Nueva, Mexico, that is present-day Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and western Texas. The U.S. also seized all of the disputed portion of Texas over which the fight initially began, and all of the Alta California province of Mexico. The Alta California province of Mexico constitutes present-day California, Nevada and Utah, and other parts of Colorado, Wyoming, Arizona, and New Mexico. When it was over, somewhere between 60,000 to 80,000 Mexican citizens living in these territories were turned into U.S. citizens. Now, the second thing we said about the southern border myth is that the Mexican-American War was, as I sort of mentioned, really rooted in that earlier war between Texas and Mexico that ultimately led to Texas independence in 1836. That war was effectively about slavery and was a precursor to our civil war. As more Anglo settlers came to eastern Texas from the southern American states, and in particular from Louisiana in the early 1800s, Mexico decided to do two things in 1829 to stop them. First, and to the economic detriment, of the settlers from our southern states. The Mexican government ended slavery throughout Mexico, and therefore in Texas as well, which was then a Mexican province. So importantly, Mexico ended slavery by statute, without firing a single bullet, 30 years earlier than we did. And second, the Mexican government also ended legal immigration into Texaco, into Texas, into Mexico. Now this didn't stop the Anglo settlers from the southern states. They just continued to come into Texas, in other words, into Mexico, illegally. Now the irony of this fact, uh, given our concerns today, should not be lost on us or on any of the policy makers making policy today in the United States of America where it is an indisputable fact that Americans were illegal immigrants into Mexico long before any Mexicans illegally came to the United States. In addition, the border between Mexico and the United States did not define either nation. The United States was the United States before the war, and once settled, and without moving an inch, the largest component of U.S. citizens in the seized territories after the war 
had been Mexican citizens mere moments before. So much for the sanctity of the southern border. For in truth, borders do not make or create nations. Were that the case, the wall between East and West Berlin, put up by the communists in 1961, would have created two nations. But it didn't, and eventually it came down. Nor will a wall make America a nation or preserve it as one. Because America was an idea long before it became a juridical entity or a defined last landmass. That idea is memorialized in the Declaration of Independence's self evident truths equality, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and in the Constitution's command for equal protection. Those truths and that command are universal. In other words, they apply to all people, including immigrants, foreigners, and even illegal or undocumented aliens. Which takes us to the next immigration myth and the last immigration myth we need to destroy, the illegality myth. The illegality myth is pretty simple. According to it, the United States is besieged with undocumented aliens who have arrived or stayed here illegally. Proponents of this myth assert that the problem is a growing one, that is, that the number of illegal or undocumented, undocumented aliens is expanding by leaps and bounds. Proponents also claim that the problem at its worst in perils and at its best undermines the whole notion of an American nation. On this view, what Donald Trump really means when he says that a nation without borders is not a nation is that a nation which cannot keep out illegals is not a nation. Finally, the proponents of this myth maintain that these undocumented or illegal visitors are literally destroying the middle class. Again, Trump is the go-to advocate for this position. In his online position paper entitled Immigration Reform uh, That Will Make America Great Again, all his papers say they're going to make America great again. Trump asserts, and I'm quoting, that decades of disastrous immigration policies have destroyed our middle class. The influx of foreign workers holds down salaries, keeps unemployment high, and makes it difficult for poor and working Americans to earn a middle class wage, close quote. Ladies and gentlemen, all of these claims are false. First thing that must be said is this, whatever its extent, the problem of undocumented or illegal aliens is a relatively recent one. In fact, it did not really become a problem until after passage of the Immigration Reform Act in 1965. And this is not because the Asian and Hispanic immigrants who came thereafter were more disposed than their 19th or 20th century predecessors to commit crimes. Rather, it is because the United States, for the lion's share of its history, did not restrict immigration in any meaningful sense. Put differently, there weren't illegal immigrants in the United States in the 19th or 20th century because it wasn't illegal for most of the people who wanted to come here to actually do so. During the two great immigration waves of the 19th and 20th century, early 20th century, the period that saw record numbers of immigrants, 33 million of them, there were no restrictions on European and Western hemispheric immigrants. And after the ill, the non-literate, and you had to be non-literate in your own language, and prostitutes were excluded, it was more or less the case that anyone who wanted to come to this country could in fact do so. During that same period, the only categorical restrictions that did exist were restrictions excluding and later greatly restricting Chinese and other Asian immigrants. These restrictions, however, were easily enforceable and rarely violated, principally because of the long journey across the Pacific that had to be undertaken by any potential violators. In effect, therefore, and to put it bluntly, in the 19th and early 20th century, the nation's borders were about as porous as could be during that period. Nor was there a large population of illegal or undocumented immigrants during the so-called restricted period between 1924 and 1965. On the one hand, this was because there weren't sustained conditions leading to immigration from the South. 
And then on, and on the other, it's because the United States regularly legalized entry for whole classes of political refugees. This, this last point, the regularization of immigration for political refugees, is how an increased number of Hungarians arrived after the Soviet Union crushed the Prague Revolt in 1956. And it is also how increased numbers of Cubans were allowed in after the Cuban Revolution in 1959. And the opposite, namely the refusal to consider them political refugees fleeing persecution, explains uh, tragically, and I think it has to be said completely dishonorably, why the country did not take in many Jews fleeing Germany during World War II. Nevertheless, the so-called problem of undocumented or illegal residents is more or less a relatively recent one. It is also not a growing problem, or an economic problem, or one that a wall will end, or one whose so-called solution, deportation, will not create millions of innocent victims. In fact, the opposite is the case. Here are the numbers that tell the real story. First, at the end of 2014, the last year for which we had data, there were 11.3 million unauthorized, undocumented, or illegal immigrants in the United States. This represented a decline over a period of seven years from a peak of approximately 12.3 million undocumented immigrants 2007. The trend here is downward. All the rhetoric from the right wing to the contrary notwithstanding. There are also more illegal immigrants leaving the country now than are coming into it. Second, since 2008, and this is according to demographic experts at the old Immigration and Naturalization Service that no longer exists. It's now been folded into what's known as Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE. But since 2008, there have been more illegal immigrants who entered this country legally and then just overstayed their visas than there have been who crossed our borders illegally in the first place. And regardless of when they came, within the group of unauthorized immigrants as a whole, as many as a third to 40% came into the country legally but then overstayed their visas. Now these figures are critical because they underscore the fact that southern border control, including the much valued desire of some to build a wall, will not address a very large share, perhaps as high as half, of the supposed problem. Third, the group of more than 11 million undocumented immigrants has approximately 3.8 million children who were born in the United States and have been raised here. These children are not illegal in any sense of that word. They are American citizens, entitled to the full protection of the US Constitution and the laws of the states in which they live. This means they cannot be deported and, under the laws of the states in which they live, cannot be removed from the custody of their parents. Fourth, and also within the group of approximately 11 million undocumented or unauthorized immigrants. Approximately 20% of them are married to either a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident. Finally, there is no evidence that illegal immigration has caused a decline in the wages of American workers. As a general matter, immigration, including immigration after 1965, has been a boom to American workers. In fact, in 2007, Republican President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors reported that, and I'm quoting, immigrants not only help fuel the nation's economic growth, but also have an overall positive effect on the American economy as a whole and on the income of native-born Americans, close quote. In that same report, the council estimated that the annual wage gains for U.S. workers due to immigration alone was $30 billion. Though only about 5% of the labor force is comprised of unauthorized immigrants, those immigrants are part of that group responsible for these gains. They pay taxes, 
consume goods and services, and if they were legalized, they'd do more of both. Now, given all these numbers, it's quite clear that the nativist uh, throw them all out impulse currently in vogue among certain factions of this country is both overwrought and undersourced. Immigration is not a problem. Illegal immigration, which is declining, is neither large enough nor consequential enough to justify the energy being spent on it. And the solution of mass deportation will create more problems by making victims of children and spouses who are citizens or legal residents than it will ever solve. Most importantly, the fact that we remain a nation of immigrants, far from weakening America in the decades ahead, can only make it stronger, can only make us stronger, and the world safer. It is imperative that we appreciate this last point, especially today, and it is on this last point that I want to conclude. The world is getting smaller. In a growing number of places, it is also getting a lot nastier. Where that nastiness is most evident, the root cause is intolerance, generally of the religious or ethnic variety. And at its worst, the outcome of that intolerance is terrorism. The only real solution to intolerance is diversity. It is the only real solution because only it creates the actual evidence which renders groundless the fears which fuel intolerance in the first place. It is a lot easier to despise the Muslim you do not know on the next continent than it is to despise the Muslim you do know who lives next door. Now, none of this should be news to any of us here in the United States. It should not be news because we have lived the experience of seeing intolerance dissipate as that immigration mosaic has been stitched together and diversity has done its job. A century and a half ago, it was a lot easier to despise the Catholic in Rome you did not know than it was to despise the Catholic next door you did know. And just a few decades ago, it was a lot easier for a white American to despise the African American who went to a segregated school than it was to despise the African American who sat next to him in school. If we continue to welcome immigrants, if we celebrate rather than suffocate the different traditions and cultures each immigrant group brings to these shores, if we create paths, if we create paths to citizenship for those caught in an artificial illegality, refusing to accept the false notion that their work steals my job, and if we reject any litmus test that would ban from these shores anyone based on their religion, we can extend our commitment to diversity and create, or really recreate, those examples of tolerance the rest of the world now so desperately needs. In short, we can recognize immigration as the solution it has always been, not the problem Donald Trump claims it has now become. And if we do that, we can prove America is great again. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of Mount Aloysius College, thank you for sharing your voice with our community. The topic of immigration is very important since it is a critical concern of our Mercy Sisters. So we're going to turn right now to the audience to see if there's any questions for our guest speaker. Oh, one right here. 
We pass over the microphone to Teresa. Hi. Um, what immigration issue do you feel America has not, like, I'm sorry, what immigration issue do you feel that America has done the least about that you think that we really should? I think, I think what it's done the least about most recently is the whole issue of illegal or undocumented immigration. Um, I've been, as um, your president remarked, I've been pretty active in politics for a period of 30 years and ran for Congress in the early 90s. And I remember taking positions on this issue during that campaign. And I also remember thinking at that time that we had a real opportunity to um, advance the ball to create a regime where um, illegals would basically be made legal and um, would be given a path to citizenship. And that even appeared possible um, in 2008. Um, and since then, um, and, and to a certain extent, largely as a consequence of the economic downturn, but also as a consequence of the um, aggressive right-wing tendencies of one political party. The ability to do that politically has more or less dissipated and, and, and into its place has been substituted um, this, this abhorrent and xenophobic rhetoric that is extraordinarily dangerous, historically false, um, and, and, and incredibly pernicious. So, um, the biggest problem we're not solving is, is the undocumented or illegal um, immigrant problem. Um, and unfortunately, the failure to solve that is itself creating space in which you know, this overheated and xenophobic rhetoric, I mean rhetoric that you haven't heard um, in this country at this level uh, since the middle of the 19th century, um, is now um, uh, uh, seeming to take over at least um, one of our political parties. And I, I think that is um, incredibly dangerous. Do you believe that informing mainly youth and just the general public needs to be a top-down approach, or do you think that enough citizens become aware of the truth and what you're talking about that we can really start a new revolution and a spreading of awareness? So that's a question that asks, does the dissemination, dissemination of the information have to be top-down or bottom-up? I mean, I think the answer is it has to be both. I mean, I think that um, you have to uh, communicate at the grassroots level, uh, and so, you know, speeches like these have to be given in colleges and churches, in, um, in Rotary Clubs and Kiwanis Clubs um, throughout the country. Um, I would especially um, do that in, um, in, in parts of this country that are more prone um, to accept uh, the, the, the Trump analysis uh, than not. So um, I was particularly interested in coming to this part of the country to do that because Western Pennsylvania, the whole Appalachian Belt is somewhat um, susceptible to uh, the Trump message. But, um, you know, um, despite the illustrious remarks of your president, I'm a small fry in the, uh, in the debate, and uh, I think that the presidents and the senators and everybody else have to do the same thing. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not a shock to anybody, I'm a Democrat, and I think the people in the Democratic Party who are speaking about this issue are, are saying the right things and should continue to do that and should continue to uh, press Congress to make some progress on the issue. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, what is seemingly becoming a, a larger and larger distinction in Europe between migrants and refugees, and if you have any insight or uh, even a gut level reaction to what's happened just in the last few days against Angela Merkel. And my, my gut level reaction is that, is that what's happened in the last few days uh, with respect to Merkel in Germany is, is, 
is, is sad um, because um, <clears throat> I'm not always a Merkel fan. Um, when it comes to economic policy uh, in the last decade, I think um, Merkel and a, lo a large number of the European elites um, in falling in love with austerity have done substantial damage to the continent. And more importantly, they may have done substantial damage to the European project, which is critical and, and anyone who knows history knows this, the, the European project is what solved the problem of the European war. Um, so I had my problems with Merkel. That said, I thought her position on the refugees um, was a real profile of courage. And I was excited by the fact um, you know, that Germany welcome the refugees without restriction. And I'm a little bit worried about what's happening in Germany now, but I'm worried, worried about what's happening all across Europe because you know, we're, not, we're not in fascist territory yet, but there are certainly uh, political groups over there that seem to be moving um, the polity in that direction. Now, there's a limited amount that any of us can do to try to change the world, even though we might hope to do a great amount. So there's not much I can do to change Europe. There's not much you and I can do to change Europe. But given what's happening in Europe right now, I think it's even more important that the United States reject the type of xenophobia that Trump is using in his campaign, and that we recognize both the real importance of immigration and the type of work uh, that it does. Um, I, I really do think, you know, the mixing of peoples is the ultimate and only solution to terrorism. I, I, you're not going to you're not going to be able to kill them all. You're not going to be able to find them all, um, and you can. You can ruin any democratic project if you develop a security state with the apparatus <coughs> sufficient to do so. Nevertheless, you know, the fundamental you know, job of a government is to protect its citizens. So the question to the governors is what's the way in which you're going to do that long term? And I think long term, the only way to do that is to mix us all up. I mean, it, it is a lot harder to, you know, hate the Muslim in Saudi Arabia than it is to hate the Muslim who lives next door. If you get to know people, if you live with them, if you go to school with them, if you talk to them, if you understand their culture, it, it makes a huge difference. How many people in this room have read the Quran? Show of hands. One. We should all be reading it because we need to understand it. We need to understand where it comes from and what it means and what it says so that we can point out what it doesn't say when the terrorists try to embrace it and use it to justify what they're doing. Um, if you had the opportunity to uh, speak to some of the governors in the uh, legislature, uh, uh, that, that say that they don't want to have Syrian refugees um, in their state or you know in their counties. Um, if you had the opportunity to sit down and talk with them, what would you say to them to, to try to convince them that their you know, argument might be invalid or might be based on um, you know, fallacies that are actually true? <laughs> uh, being me, the first thing I probably say to them is that you're wrong. And that might stop the conversation, so we might not get too far. Um, I think with respect to, I think, I think that, that that position was a position in search of a justification. In other words, the people came up with the position on the assumption that it solved a problem that they 
ne that they couldn't necessarily prove that the influx of refugees would cause in the first place. The basic supposition is that among the class of refugees that would come here from Syria or come, or among the class, and this is Trump's basic supposition, among the class of Muslims worldwide, that there are some people within that group that um, are terrorists or will become terrorists. Now, that's an undoubtedly true proposition. But there are Christians who um, could come to this country and become terrorists. There are atheists who could come to this country and, come to, and become terrorists. So, so the first thing you have to ask someone who decides that a, a whole group can't come in out of concerns that some portion thereof might cause problems is, you know, what are you basing that on? You know, what intelligence are you basing it on? What history are you basing it on? What facts are you basing it on? And I'll tell you this, with respect to, for example, Trump's categorical demand that all non-citizen Muslims be banned, there is no factual basis. I mean, the intelligence community here and in Western Europe has already done the work and they've come to the conclusion that an infinitesimal portion of Muslims are even at risk, at risk to become terrorists and that even within that group that are at risk, an infinitesimal an infinitesimal number of them will actually become terrorists. So, you know, in lawyer speak, I'm a lawyer, um, the, the, the overbreath of that type of proposition is just enormous. And, you're, you know, you're not, you're going to solve whatever problem exists and you have no idea what it is at enormous, enormous cost. You know, our, our value, our, our, um, the thing that we show the world is, 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 is the idea, the idea of America, the idea of equality, the idea of liberty. And when you pervert that value, when you distort it, when you destroy it, you destroy the essence of America. That's a lot more likely to undermine the notion of American nationhood than any illegal entry into this country. Another question? All the way up in the back. Lucy. Um, 
demand. Um, we're actually pretty good at interdicting supply. Um, you know, the, the, um, the um, DOJ and the state law enforcement folks um, <clears throat> have done a very, very good job at um, stopping the flow. It doesn't mean that there aren't, there is a lot coming in through the South, but you know, they've been successful over the years in, in, in lowering it out by a lot and, and, and investigating and, and prosecuting the people responsible. I mean, the other problem, though, is demand. I mean, and frankly, the other problem is, is also illegality. If you, have, if you have a good or a service that you define as illegal, then by definition, it's going to become very expensive, and the profit that someone can make by bringing it in is going to become enormous. So, I mean, one solution um, might be to move in the direction of Colorado or other states, which, for example, have legalized marijuana, um, because then you could regulate it and um, create a larger market, and the, the, the likelihood is that the price would go down and the profit would be there. Um, and the other way is to, um, you know, hopefully lower demand um, on the stuff that really is bad, heroin and crack cocaine. And the, the way to do that is with education and with drug addiction programs, and it has to be done at the grassroots level, at the neighborhood level, at the church level, I think. All right, we have one more question, and the microphone goes past on to President Bully. Do you think that it would be a good idea to make immigration policies more accommodating to immigrants trying to enter the country? Because as it stands, as I'm aware, they have little to no support in learning English and becoming productive members of society. You know, I, I don't know, I don't know what, what um, what factual data are you relying on to support the last part of your, your statement? Um, my, what I read, and, and my information is just on the basis of what I've read and looked at, um, that immigrant groups as a whole um, do a pretty good job um, at attempting to become proficient in English, that there's a, a pretty aggressive effort made uh, to do that. It doesn't mean that native languages are not spoken uh, and not used, they are, um, but um, Certainly, the immigrant groups, so far in terms of the data that I've seen, um, are attempting uh, to uh, to learn and become proficient in English. In terms of um, uh, the work opportunities, that's kind of a double-edged sword because part of the reason that illegal immigration has gone down, especially illegal immigration from um, south of the border, is that since 2008 the economic opportunities here haven't been as great as they were um, beforehand. That's been especially true with respect to <clears throat> potential illegal immigrants from Mexico because with the passage of NAFTA and the development of um, economic zones within the northern Mexican states, the economic um, um, possibilities for a lot of Mexican workers have improved. A lot of the flow of, of illegals um, from south of the border is a flow through Mexico, but it's a flow largely characterized by Central Americans who are, who are trying to um, escape um, dangerous and violent uh, conditions. And I actually think that those folks should be treated more like refugees. I mean, we're very good at taking in political refugees. <clears throat> we're not very good at taking in social refugees, people who are refugees from you know, cultures of violence um, who are sending their kids on these trips because they don't want them um, to be killed in the neighborhoods in which they live. Just a, a last word to thank uh, Neil. I counted uh, 22 different voices uh, that he shared with us uh, in the course of his interesting presentation. I thank him for uh, dispelling, explaining so clearly the three myths about immigration. And lastly, I thank Glenn for starting us off with those seminal words uh, in American poetry, um, which do us well to remember as we try to confront difficult issues like immigration at the same time that we're trying to develop our own voices. So thank you all. Those were excellent questions. Um, we're very grateful for Neil coming to the Southern Alleghenies and joining us at Mount Wishes College. Thank you. Jim.